I wasn't here last time, so I couldn't. August the 12th, 2012. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Durham Planning Commission. The members of the Durham Planning Commission have been appointed by the City Council and the County Board of Commissioners as an advisory board <coughs> to the elected officials. You should know that the elected officials have the final say on any issues before us tonight. If you wish to speak on an agenda item, tonight, please go to the table on my left, your right, and sign up to speak. For those who wish to speak, please state your name and address clearly when you come to the podium, and please speak clearly into the microphone. Each side, speaking, those speaking in favor of an item and those speaking in opposition to an item will have 10 minutes to present for each side. The time will be divided among all persons wishing to speak. If you are here opposing a rezoning tonight, you should be aware of what is called a protest petition. A protest peti petition can be very helpful to those residents who live in the rezoning area. Please consult the planning department staff for any details on a protest petition, and they will be happy to help you. You should also keep in constant, con in <coughs> constant touch with the planning department as to when your case will go before the elected officials for a final vote. Finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative, so if a motion fail, if a, if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. Thank you. Could we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Beelan. Present. Commissioner Busby. Present. Commissioner Davis. Present. Commissioner Freeman. Present. Commissioner Gibbs. Present. Chair Harris. Present. Commissioner Hollisworth. Here. Commissioner Huff. Here. Commissioner Hyman. Here. Commissioner Miller. Present. Commissioner Paget. Commissioner Whitley. Present. Commissioner Winders. Present. Uh, for the minutes, Commissioner Paget is out of town and has been granted an absentee. So having a quorum, uh, do we have an adjustments to the agenda? Good evening, Chair Davis and members of the commission. Pat Young with the Planning Department. I, I do have three adjustments. Um, Mr. Busby, uh, Commissioner Busby's name was not on the agenda. He was appointed after the agenda was prepared. So we'd like to make sure his name is reflected um, in the minutes. And he was called at roll, of course. And we have other se several other new commissioners here, which, which you may want to introduce uh, later, Chair Davis. Um, excuse me, Harris. Um, <laughs> so many new names. Um, <laughs> those are two old ones, though. Um, additionally, on item five, um, we have a resolution for former Commissioner Re Rebecca Board, and her name was inadvertently omitted from the uh, agenda. And uh, on item 8A, the uh, election of the chair will be at the end of the September meeting as per the bylaws, and that was just also an error. So those are three adjustments. Are there any other adjustments to the agenda? If not, the chair will receive a motion to adopt the agenda as uh, corrected or amended. So moved. Second. All in favor of adopting the chair as corrected, please raise your right hand. The agenda has been approved 12 to 0. Okay. The Next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from a couple of months ago. Do we have anyone wishing to speak? Or what action would you like to take? Move approved. Second. It's been moved by Miller, seconded by Whitley, that we approve the minutes from two months ago. All those in favor, let it be known by a show of hands. All those in opposition? Minutes are approved, 12 to zero. At this time, if I could have commissioners, board, commissioners, 
Walters, Commissioner Smusky, and Chairman Jones, meet me to the podium at my right, please. I will start with uh, Chairman Jones. <laughs> this is a resolution of appreciation of Mr. Antonio Jones, whereas Mr. Antonio Jones was a member of the Durham Planning Commission from April 2010 through June 2014, and whereas the Durham Planning Commission <clears throat> and the citizens of the city and county of Durham have benefited from the dedicated efforts that he displayed while serving as a member of the Durham Planning Commission and whereas the Commission desired to express its appreciation for the public of a job well done be it therefore resolved be it therefore now therefore be it resolved by the Durham Planning Commission that the Commission do hereby express its sincere appreciation for the service rendered by Mr. Jones to the citizens of the community, community that the clerk for the commission is hereby directed to spread this resolution in its entirety upon the official minutes of this commission and this resolution be therefore presented to Mr. Jones as a token of the high esteem held for him. Adopted this 12th day of August 2014, David Harris. All right, thank you. With the uh, permission of the chair, I would like to take my last three minutes, if that's okay. <laughs> yep. Um, so first, I want to thank a few people. Um, first is going to be the Durham Planning Department. I think this is probably the best group of uh, professionals that I have worked with uh, over the course of the years in any venture I've, I've ever taken on. Uh, second thing is, uh, is the elected officials. They have been uh, very responsive in our um, reports or calling or whatever the case may be. The fellow commissioners, you know, it's, 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 it's rare to find people who are willing to serve their community um, and go through the great lengths of time and research and dedication that the commissioners of the Durham Planning Commissioners, you know, we put in a lot of work doing independent research and even following up with the planning department and developers. Um, we also want to thank the developers. There's a few of you guys here today. We want to thank you because without you, there would be no Durham or the Durham Planning Commission. Um, although we may not see eye to eye on every case, but I think overall, you definitely get a grade A for all of the effort that you guys put into ensuring that Durham is a great place to live. Um, so initially, why did I join the Durham Planning Commission? I think uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Winders. She may not even remember this. Um, but I was an undergrad at North Carolina Central University, and we uh, took an urban planning class with uh, Dr. Michael Busco. And we started looking at how communities are developed, and that kind of got me inspired as to what can I do to impact my community in Durham. So initially, when I signed up, I didn't know what was going to happen. I said it was opening on the uh, township in which I represented. I said, hmm, why not? If I don't get it, it's all good. I'll go back, you know. But I did. The elected officials saw fit to appoint me. But I want to take the opportunity to thank her just for, um, for her dedication and time in going over the urban planning courses and all of the, the effort she put into. And this is a special shout out, if I will. Dr. Uh, well, Brother Ray is here. Um, way back when I was at Southside, kind of helping him out doing some things at that Southside Community Center. Um, before Southside became kind of, I guess, the state it is right now, that was many years ago. So to be on the planning commission, and voted for that case the last time around. That's a full circle moment for me, as just doing some random work in the community, trying to better Durham, and actually having the opportunity to vote on that case, and seeing the actual, I guess, fruits of our labor now at Southside. Um, and for the commissioners, you know, 
oftentimes they may see us in Walmart or at South Point. They want to stop and talk to us about various things that's going on in their communities. And like I tell everybody, it's a process with development. You know, so when the bulldozers show up, it's kind of too late, you know. But now, as we see here at, you know, the Durham Planning Commission, this is kind of the beginning. So all of you got all the residents that came out today to show their support or opposition to an item that's going on in your, in your neighborhood, we still need the citizen input. That's the most critical point of any community development. If citizens don't show up, anything can happen. You know, but I, I would like to say this, you know, when I'm out and about all through North Carolina, South Carolina, I love to tell people I'm from Durham. I'm not from Durham, but I live in Durham. I own a house in Durham. But I like to tell people, everything that's going on in Durham is a microcosm of what's going on in the United States, you know, with urban planning. You know, one of the biggest issues that we didn't tackle here on the Durham Planning Commission, but it's, it's, they're going to eventually, it's going to be the uh, issues of affordable housing. We didn't get to affordable housing, and we didn't get to some of the uh, light rail issues that's going to be coming up, but those are going to be two of the most pressing needs for the Durham community in the next five to ten years. What are we going to do about affordable housing and what are we going to do about the light rail system? So as those cases unfold, one of the things that I want to leave the uh, Durham Planning Commission with is, and the developers, when it's all said and done, when all the Durham Planning Commissioners are cycled off and all of the developers are long gone, the projects are at full build out, it has to be something that you can be proud of at the end of the day, whether you voted for it or against it, and even as a citizen, when you see things coming up in the community, you know, you want to do things that's going to make you be a proud resident of Durham. Um, and lastly, I want to thank uh, my brothers of uh, Omega Psi Phi Fraternity. I see a few of them in the house today. Once again, yes, I had to thank them, of course. <laughs> um, once again, that's, that's, that's one of our uh, four cardinal principles is really uplift, you know, our community. It's, it's, that's the basis of everything that we do, is community. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over. I think my three minutes is maybe up. Um, <laughs> But you, you won't see me again, um, and most people know. Um, I just had a son, he'll be four months, uh, for three months on the 14th, um, and I'm starting my uh, doctorate program, so that's one of my, uh, that's my main reason for not seeking reappointment, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed my time on the Durham Planning Commission. I still live in Durham, you still see me. I'm not going anywhere, you need me, call me. Um, but without further ado, I'll go ahead and uh, take my seat now. Oh, yes, oh, where my baby, come here. Oh, is he asleep? Okay. Wait. <laughs> okay, there you go. There we go. <laughs> yeah, it's a ba it's a baby baby. Yes. Yeah. The what? <laughs> okay. He has his mittens on. He likes scratching himself. Oh, that's my baby. I know you sleep, buddy. Okay, wave at him. I'm gonna take your gloves off. There you go, wave at him. This is uh, Aiden Antonio Jones, um, the newest resident of the greatest city in, in America, Durham. So I'll go ahead and uh, sit down now. This is my wife, Demetria Jones. All right, thank you. And thank you for all your services. Mrs. Rebecca Boyd. Resolution and appreciation of Ms. Rebecca Board. Whereas Ms. Rebecca Board was a member of the Durham Planning Commission from April 2011 through June 2014, and whereas the Durham Planning Commission and the citizens of and the citizens of the of the city and county of Durham have benefited from the dedicated efforts that she displayed while serving as a member of the Durham Planning Commission and whereas the commission desired to express its appreciation for the public of a job well done. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Durham Planning Commission that this commission do hereby express its sincere appreciation for the services rendered by Ms. Board to the citizens of this community. The, that the clerk for the commission is hereby directed to spread this resolution in its entirety upon the official minutes of this commission and this resolution is hereby presented to Ms. Boyd as a token of the high esteem held for her, adopted the 12th day of August, 2014, David Harris, Chair. Thank you very much. 
You all don't want a speech, so I'll just say me too to everything Antonio just said. And to say this has been a really wonderful experience the last three years, working with the planning staff, the other people on the planning commissioner. I was grateful to, for the appointment, and I have had a wonderful time. Thank you. Mr. David Smusky. Resolution and appreciation of Mr. David Smusky, whereas Mr. David Smusky was a member of the Durham Planning Commission from April 2011 through June 2014, and whereas the Durham Planning Commission and the citizens of the city and county of Durham have benefited from the dedicated efforts that he displayed while serving as a member of the Durham Planning Commission. And whereas this commission did desire to express its appreciation for the, for the public of a job well done, now therefore be it resolved by the Durham Planning Commission that this commission do hereby sincerely express its appreciation for services rendered by Mr. Smusky to, this, to the citizens of this community, that the clerk for the commission is hereby directed to spread this resolution in its entirety upon the official minutes of this commission and this resolution is hereby presented to Mr. Smusky as a token of the high esteem held for him. Adopted this 12th day of August 2014, David Harris Chair. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and fellow citizens. Again, I would like to thank Mr. Jones for his leadership uh, during my tenure and I appreciate the comments that you made and I fully agree with them. I think this, the planning staff has been tremendous at, uh, and citizens ought to be proud that we have such professional staff and I thank all the people that have signed up to fill the spaces and thank you for coming out and, and supporting our community. This, is a, this has been a great, uh, a great time and at some point in the future I hope to be back serving the citizens of Durham again. So thank you very much. Mrs. Bynum Walters. Hi. Resolution and appreciation for Ms. Bynum Walters, whereas Ms. Bynum Walters was a member of the Durham Planning Commission from May 2013 through June 2014, and whereas the Durham Planning Commission and the citizens of the city and county of Durham have benefited from the dedicated efforts that she displayed while serving as a member of the Durham Planning Commission. This commission desired to express its appreciation for the public of a job well done, and now be it resolved by the Durham Planning Commission that this commission do hereby express its sincere appreciation for the services rendered by Ms. Walters to the citizens of this community, that the clerk for the commission is hereby directed to spread this resolution in its entirety upon the official minutes of this commission and this resolution is hereby presented to Ms. Walters as a token of the high esteem held for her. Adopted this 12th day of August 2014, David Harris Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to also uh, thank Chair Jones for his good leadership during my short tenure and also the thoughtful comments of my fellow commissioners and the excellent work of the staff. Thank you. And a hearty thanks and appreciation for all four of you. Thank you. Chair Harris and other commissioners, before we move to the next item, I, I can certify for the record that all public hearing items before you tonight have been advertised in accordance with the requirements of law and their affidavits to that effect on file with the Planning Department. Thank you, Commissioner Mill. Mr. Chairman, um, to make those resolutions official, I move that the uh, Commission adopt the resolutions honoring Antonio Jones, David Smudsky, Bonham Walters, and Rebecca Board. It's been motion and second that the resolutions honoring uh, 
Chairman Antonio Jones, Commissioners David Smusky, Commissioner Bynum Walters, and Commissioner Rebecca Boyd be adopted. All those in favor of that motion, please signify by a raise of hands. Motion has been approved to adopt the resolutions for Rebecca Board, David Smutsky, Bynum Walters, Chair Antonia Jones, 12 to 0. Thank you. And now the Chair will open the public hearing for plan amendment with concurrent zoning map change for Urban Terrace at LaSalle, A13000010. A1300 zero one zero and zoning case z one three zero 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 three one good evening i'm carla rosenberg with the planning department i'm here to present on erwin terrace at LaSalle street um, plan amendment portion the applicant erwin terrace limited partnership is proposing to amend approximately 19.64 acres of the future land use map from urban tier to compact neighborhood tier this change would allow the applicant to increase the intensity of the development of the site, which is located next to a future light rail transit stop. The total site encompasses four parcels, which will maintain their current land use designations of commercial and institutional. This is a map showing the broader area and future land use context. Irwin Road runs diagonally from the lower left to the upper right part of the screen, bordering the site to the southeast. The subject site is adjacent to the present boundary of the compact neighborhood tier, which surrounds a variety of high-intensity developments, including Duke Hospital and Duke Manor. The site is also located near the convergence of several major arteries, including highways 15501, 147, and Interstate 85. There have been several changes to the future land use map for these par parcels over time. An earlier small area plan called for this site to be designated as mixed use and institutional. The 2005 comprehensive plan designated the area as commercial and institutional with the understanding that mixed use projects are allowed anywhere as long as one of those uses is consistent with the comprehensive plan designation. It also drew the compact neighborhood tier boundary at LaSalle Street west of a series of transit stops along Irwin Road. Subsequently, an additional future transit stop would be added to the west of the corridor at South LaSalle Street. In the justification statement, the applicant suggests that the current tier boundary designation of urban tier ought to be amended because it does not allow the intensity or density for a site situated adjacent to a future transit stop. The applicant further states that the existing compact neighborhood tier designation furthers city and county policies contained within the comprehensive plan of increasing development intensities for mixed use projects and of providing incentive, incentives for those projects to integrate uses vertically. Staff has reviewed the request against these four criteria found in the Unified Development Ordinance. Consistency with adopted plans and policies, compatibility with existing and or future land use patterns, lack of substantial adverse impact, and adequacy of shape and size of the site. For the first criterion, we found that the proposed plan amendment was consistent with land use policies in the comprehensive plan, including policies regarding density and contiguous development. The first policy defines the compact neighborhood tier as an area surrounded um, surrounding a proposed fixed guideway transit station that encourages high density redevelopment and new development integrating a mix of uses. The second supports orderly development patterns that take advantage of existing urban services and avoids loop leapfrogging or non-contiguous scattered development. The third promotes public transportation to increase the mobility of residents, employees, and visitors. And the fourth seeks to reinforce the downtown and compact neighborhood tiers as supportive of multimodal transportation through increased density allowances and supportive infrastructure and design requirements. The second criterion, um, the site sits immediately adjacent to an area already designated within the compact neighborhood tier. To expand the compact neighborhood tier to the southeast to capture these parcels would allow for more intense development along what is expected to become a major transit corridor. And for the third and fourth criteria, we determined that there is no substantial adverse impact with regard to infrastructure, environmental protection, or future demand of land uses. Uh, and finally, the staff determined that the site is of adequate shape and size to accommodate the proposed land uses. And so th the request meets all of the criteria of for a plan amendments, and the staff is recommending approval. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Amy Wolf to come forward to present the zoning portion of this case. Good evening, Amy Wolf with the planning department. And this next 
presentation is for the zoning map change case associated with this plan amendment. Again, this case is case Z1300031, Irwin Road at LaSalle. The applicant is Triple E Apartment Management Incorporated. It is within the city's jurisdiction, and the request is from mixed use with a development plan in the urban tier at, to mixed use with a development plan in the compact neighborhood tier. The site acreage is 9.86 acres, roughly 10 acres smaller than the geography of the plan amendment. Um, this the zoning map change will request to change a portion of the zoning of, of that in area encumbered by the plan amendment. Pardon? Uh, the site is, is three parcels uh, for the zoning map change. It's in the urban tier. It's adjacent to the compact neighborhood tier uh, where the border is at LaSalle Street to the north uh, is the current compact neighborhood tier. However, it's currently in the urban tier at the intersection of Irwin Road and LaSalle Street. It's also known as uh, Irwin Terrace. There's uh, presently two buildings on the side that front along Irwin Road and there's some multifamily apartments in the back with a vacant uh, parcel at the, at the very corner. The zoning in the area is, is multifamily, mixed use, commercial, and university um, college. The request does meet the requirements of a development plan uh, for the mixed use district. I'll uh, elaborate on some of the commitments in, in just a bit. Uh, but you can see here that all the minimum requirements are met. Here's an existing layout of the site. There's a stream running along the, the rear portion of the parcel. It, it, it's on two sides of Lambeth Circle. Uh, and again, LaSalle, LaSalle Street is on, um, on the east and east north, and the, er, the other frontage is Irwin Road. Here's the proposed map from the development plan. There are a number of commitments represented on the plan. It'll show the access points, which are on both sides of the existing Lambeth Circle. There is an access on La to LaSalle Street, and there's a number of dr driveways, uh, a, a maximum of eight total driveways off of Lambeth Circle. And some of the other commitments for the residential um, they're requesting a range from 72 to 322 residential units. Um, and you see the other breakdowns of, there's a number of office, a possibility for public and civic use as well as commercial. And whenever the site access points, there's an impervious surface limit of 91.1%. The location of the access points and the building and parking envelope, there's two of them on either side of Lambeth Circle are commit, uh, graphic commitments. There's a number of text commitments. Uh, the project will be completed in two phases. There's some transportation requirements that uh, would require improvements at the um, site entrances, as detailed in the staff report, and um, to provide a bus shelter, which is, there's already one there, but to make sure that there's a bus shelter to serve the site. There's design commitments also associated with this request that describe the roof line, the building materials, any uh, architectural features, as well as how it will transition into the area. There are landscape design guidelines as well, um, which would um, provide the requirements for meet, uh, meeting the landscape of the area. Again, as Ms. Rosenberg indicated, the site is presently designated commercial and institutional in the urban tier and the plan amendment is a request to extend that um, for that reason because it's in the urban tier currently it, it's not consistent with current policy but again there's a plan uh, companion plan amendment this, the request is consistent with all the other policies um, that we've reviewed that are applicable to this site and ordinances as well and staff determines that should the plan amendment be approved this request would be consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances and staff is here avail available for any questions. Okay. 
right, I have two people signed up to speak. One definitely for Dan Joel, and one a conditional for, I guess. So I'm going to put that in the against column. So you have 10 minutes. Great. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Dan Jewell with Coulter Jewell Thames. Uh, our firm, Coulter Jewell Thames, is assisting uh, the developer in the uh, design and, and entitlements of this project. With me is Jeremy Anderson in my office, uh, who's the uh, lead landscape architect project manager. And of course, we have Robinson Everett, who is the uh, family that owns the property, and next to him is Robert Everett, who's assisting with uh, the project management from a uh, construction standpoint. Um, I'd like to first do a little bit of a history lesson. Our firm has actually had a long history with this project in particular. Uh, we worked on the initial design and the approval of the current development plan that created the zoning that's on the property today back in 1999, um, Robinson's father approached us and said, I was just in California, there's this new thing called vertical mixed use, I want to do it in Durham. The Durham ordinance at the time had recently been amended to allow and promote for vertical mixed use. So over the course of six or eight months, we heard his story, tried to figure out what to do on this site, came up with a plan that was resoundingly approved by the city council as a very forward-thinking way to develop in Durham along a corridor which at that time was thought to be urbanizing in the future but had not yet. Even a little farther back than that, uh, if, if many of you know the history of the Everett family, uh, they have been active in Durham in civic engagement and uh, uh, doing public good going back to the 1890s. They've been here for a very long time. The Everett family acquired this property in the 1950s. And at the time, they developed an affordable multifamily housing development on here, which many of you probably remember back in the day that existed until the mid-90s. In the mid-90s, they took that, those 72 apartment units and rebuilt them in the back corner of the property, if you've been back here to that existing building, that's Poplar Apartments that was built in, I think we did that in about 1970, 1997 or 98, something like that, which freed up the rest of the site for development. Um, also keep in mind the Everett's have a long history of uh, multifamily housing in this neighborhood going back to, if you're familiar with the Holly Hill Apartments, which uh, Rob grew up in and his mother still lives in to this day, an apartment unit, uh, and also the Campus Walk Apartments. So back in 1998, uh, the development plan that we had approved by the City Council was fairly forward thinking and maybe fairly dense in the context of that day. This is an aerial photo from 2002. So this is the site just as we were getting ready to prep it for the first building that exists today at Irwin, Irwin Terrace. This was the newly built Poplar Apartments in the back corner, the 70, 71, 72 units. You can see the rest of the corridor though was relatively low density. A CCB branch bank here, the Methodist retirement home, a gas station, uh, the uh, Duke, uh, 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 fitness center, things of that nature along, along Irwin Road. So at, at the time, what we were doing was a, was a fairly forward-thinking, dense community. Fast forward to 2014 and look at this same stretch today, just 12 years later. You have the Trinity Commons high-end apartment complex that's been built. 
you have the uh, Pavilion East Retail and Mixed Use Center over here. You have the lofts at Lakeview Apartments, which sit on this site. And what's interesting now is you look at the scale of what was built at Irwin Terrace in the early 2000s, how it's dwarfed into comparison of what happened prior to that. Just to let you know, they are proceeding with additional development plans right now based on what was approved under that previous development plan. There's uh, a site plan that's been approved for a new building here, mixed use office with ground floor retail on this pad. And if you've been over there of late, you'll notice that they've started construction on a parking deck in this area. Why a parking deck? Because they're being forward thinking and they know they need to go ahead and provide that additional parking for the development that is to come with those additional buildings. So recently, as many of you know, because uh, I know you've been getting updates on this and I know many of you have been active in promoting this, the, uh, the, the Durham Chapel Hill Carborough Metropolitan Planning Organization adopted what's called the locally preferred alternative for the Durham Chapel Hill light rail alignment. As part of that, they adopted station sites. And of course, as you probably know, and as was mentioned in the staff report, there's a station site proposed right in front of Irwin Terrace. So our previous thinking that we could do some modest density mixed use development has now been rewarded with a station site designated at this location. And one of the things, is, as we all know, that is uh, critical to the success of us being able to get our funding for light rail and to make it successful as time goes on is us for to build in a manner that provides transit ridership through providing workspaces, shopping opportunities, and residential opportunities so that we have opportunities for people to live, work in proximity to those light rail stations. That's what will show the numbers that will hopefully allow us to get the federal funding we need for this to go forward. And Irwin Terrace is ready. That's why we are in today asking for this request. So one thing I would like to clarify, uh, the staff report mentions extension of the compact neighborhood tier. We actually think of this as a new compact neighborhood tier centered on our station site. I believe if you talk to the staff, they will tell you that the long range goal would be to have a compact neighborhood designation at every light rail transit site. It just so happens though that we have light rail stations that are relatively close together here, Duke Medical Center, back up toward Ninth Street, those compact neighborhoods will eventually overlap with each other. So we would like to think of this as a new compact neighborhood, not an extension of an existing one. Amy ran through the numbers for you already. Um, we are still way shy of some of the development that has occurred over at the pavilion, lofts at Lakeview, projects of that nature. And what we're proposing is additional residential density, office density, public, civic, and commercial density, which again will be supportive of the light rail that we think and hope will be coming. Now, to be clear, we know that we have to handle the traffic being generated by this right now. That's why we are not pushing the limits on density and square footage. You will see in the committed elements that we are committing to making three traffic improvements to keep the level of service uh, uh, functioning properly at three places. One is at uh, Irwin Road and Cameron Avenue where we are doing some additional striping to help that level of service. The other two traffic situations where we're doing improvements are actually internal to the property where it was shown the level of service was going to drop on Lambeth coming out to Irwin and to LaSalle coming out on these. So we're going to be adding additional turn lanes there. And just to be clear, those would only be inconveniences to the people who are inside the Irwin Terrace project, not outwardly. Now one last slide, not last slide, second to the last slide I want to show you is this. So it's recognized that there's a half mile radius, a half mile walk zone uh, that's important and should be associated with these light rail stations. This bubble, the, the red area, the magenta area, shows that half mile walk. 
What was kind of intuitive to us, but until uh, we ran the numbers, and again, Robinson being in the apartment business all his life, had all of this stuff in his head, but did the research to tie it down. Um, you can see within that half mile zone, almost everything north and west of Irwin Road is already multifamily. The areas that we've highlighted are actually already considered affordable to a household of three uh, that makes 80% of the average median income, which is a goal that's been stated by the federal government in order for us to get transit funding, that we need to provide 15% affordable housing to people who make 80% of the AMI within a half mile walking distance. What that translates to is 62% of the existing housing within a half mile of this station site, this is incredible to me, is already considered affordable by HUD. And just to put a capper on it, the Poplar apartments that the Everett's built 15 years ago are already considered affordable housing. I bring this to your attention just because I've had more phone calls and emails over the last week or two about affordable housing. And whereas we think this is a good project for Durham and a necessary project to meet the needs to be supportive of transit, I think and hope you will agree with us that the affordable housing needs of this station site are already well being met to go far toward getting our federal funding of this project. Thank you for letting me go over a few minutes, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Larissa Seibel. Handing out the resolution. Uh, my name is Larissa Seibel, and I live at 2410 Park Place. And I'm handing out the resolution that you all adopted. It uh, was changed just slightly by the county commission when they adopted it and the city council when they adopted it on May 5th. But you all were the first to adopt this resolution for affordable housing around transit. And I want to thank you. Tonight, I'm here to speak for affordable housing near transit. And I want to read the, the first um, number one um, on page two after all the whereases, which is the actual affordable housing goal. Number one, it shall be the goal of the city and county of Durham to preserve and increase the stock of affordable housing within a half mile of each of the proposed Durham Orange Rail Transit stations. Consistent with state law, the city and county endorse the objective of achieving at least 15% of housing units within one half mile of each rail transit station and bus hub be affordable to families with income less than 60% of area median income here and after referred to as the affordable housing goal. The 60% of area median income is a, a goal that I think is achievable. And I wanted to illustrate some of the people who are at that income. And um, the range that I'm looking at is for one person, 60% um, of area median income is less than $27,500 a year. And for a family of four or household of four, the income is $39,400 or less. And these are folks like the people working at Duke Hospital certified nursing assistants who might make around $26,000 a year, or research assistants who might make around $28,000 a year. These are also our police officers who start at $33,000 a year, and with the new state budget, teachers uh, who start at $33,000, although they may be higher because Durham really does support our teachers. So these are the folks who probably fit in below 60% of area median income. And the goal of this, in reality, is to ensure that there is a small percentage, 15% of homes that actually stay affordable even as rents uh, may increase around the transit station, as we've seen in Charlotte and other places which have put in rail transit. So um, I'm here to, again, just ask the question, how will this rezoning and amendment 
achieve or help Durham achieve the goal of mixed income housing with 15% uh, affordable um, and dedicated to stay affordable to our neighbors, our co-workers, and our Durham residents who are making less than 60% of area median income. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience that wish to speak to this plan amendment or zoning change? If not, then we'll close the public hearing and bring the matter back before the commissioners. Are there commissioners that would like to speak? I got uh, Commissioner Davis, everybody else on this side. Commissioner Winders, Commissioner Miller, uh, Commissioner Huff, Charlotte Gibbs, and I got you, Charlie. Okay, uh, each of you have three minutes each. Uh, Commissioner uh, Davis. Well, this question is for Dan. Um, you mentioned, just, just for my clarification of what's going to happen in the future, one of the committed elements is that phase one will continue with the existing building. So you do not plan on tearing down the existing buildings, but enhance with future development. Is that correct? That's or? correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, no further questions. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Winders. I'm going to be voting against approval of this, uh, uh, this development for the affordable housing reason, as I have for, for uh, some, uh, some other um, uh, proposals. Um, and I, I believe uh, that we shouldn't be uh, expanding the compact neighborhood tier before we have some plans for for um, how we're going to meet that affordable housing goal. And I, I, um, uh, I appreciate that uh, I'm, I'm somewhat ambivalent about this because I've been learning about the, the issue as we go along too. And um, I, I know that we, you know, this planning has been going on for this thing for, for a year probably and a lot of money has been, is, has gone into uh, getting the plans this far um, and uh, that, but um, uh, I appreciate that we're talking about affordable housing now and the reason, and I would hope that uh, we can do something creative <laughs> to, uh, uh, to, to meet that 15% goal. The, the housing that is, all, that is there that is currently affordable is, is uh, very likely not to be affordable after the transit comes, comes here because, you know, our, all the, clearly all the research shows that, that uh, uh, the property right, uh, values go up when, when uh, transit comes. And I think, and I, I could be wrong about, about this, but I think that the federal uh, guidelines when they say affordable housing, they are talking about deed-restricted affordable housing. And um, so our, uh, as we have, uh, in the, the transit planning process, we have um, uh, not, we've added on another stop, but there's also been some changes in how the, the federal government um, uh, counts your, tra your travel de uh, transit demand, which is one of the factors for getting a transit approved. And uh, so uh, they have started weighting affordable housing extra. So it's not just density that supports, as our plan, uh, our, co our comprehensive plan, you know, has a, a goal of promoting uh, transit for, and it's, um, it's not just density, that uh, I'm just noticing my time there. <laughs> Fortunately, I got this written down. It's not just density, it's what kind of density. Uh, so, and I think that we, mixed income housing is desirable in the community for more reasons than just uh, it, for the long run for the community. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually just want to begin with a couple of questions. 
The first thing is, help me understand if somebody from staff, maybe Ms. Rosenberg, if we extend the tier boundary to take in the proper, the portion of the tier boundary extension that's proposed to cover this, this the segments that's now zoned University College, what's the practical impact on that? What would you be able to do in University College inside a uh, compact neighborhood that you couldn't do in the urban tier? Hi, this is Scott Whiteman from the Planning Department. It's actually the standards for the University College District are not dependent upon the tier, so it really has no effect on the current zoning of that site. But if it were to be rezoned in the future, it could take advantage of any compact tier uh, standards. Right, so if Duke were to divest itself of this property and it ceased to be University College, some other somebody wanted it to be something else, it would be evaluated in the compact tier standards rather than the urban tier standards. Yes, that's correct. Uh, it, has anybody said, I'll ask anybody who knows, is that in the works for this parcel? I'm not sure I understand why we're extending the tier boundary here and not across the street, which is also University College and all these other things. It's just the mystery in, in the report to me. I don't have an answer for that. I was prepared for that. <laughs> Dan, do you know? I, I can. Um, so if you remember the, the, the map with the, the red zone, I waved my, I have more power than I thought. <laughs> the red zone, the half mile zone, um, could, all of that could eventually be in the compact neighborhood. I mean, that would be the, the planning guidelines that the planning department would use if and when they actually have the staff resources to start creating compact neighborhoods around station sites. Um, what we did, though, is we reached out to several of the adjoining property owners uh, to see if they wanted to be included in our application because certainly we weren't going to be submitting an application for a half mile radius about this site. Um, the, uh, the folks behind us uh, declined for the time being. They said, we're not sure yet. You know, and it's complicated, just like you asked the question, what would happen to the UC zone? Uh, the folks that were interested, though, was uh, Duke University on, on the Lennox Baker property because they know that someday that will be redeveloped at a, uh, at a higher intensity. And they said, well, you know, one, you guys are doing this, so add us in the mix. We're not rezoning their property, but we're adding the tier. But secondly, uh, the university was very excited about the transit coming through and the transit stop being here at LaSalle Street. And uh, they, uh, as much as anything, told us they wanted to be included on that portion as a show of support. But just as you asked the question about what does it do to the UC, they said, but we, you know, we have you know, other development plans going on currently on the other side of Irwin Road, so don't include that but please include. So uh, the, the people that asked us to include them have been included. Thank you, Mr. Jewell. And, and Mr. Chairman, if I can ask one more question yes, of staff. Yes. Um, so one of the things that as I look at this and, and listening to the remarks that, that Commission Member um, uh, Winters has, has expressed, the staff said, oh, it's consistent with the comprehensive plan, but the comprehensive plans in goal three says we're going to develop uh, affordable housing. I don't see how this addresses that. And, and so without talking about it at great length, in future when we see especially uh, a, a significant change in residential densities uh, around these transit centers, I would like to have a staff report, if it's, if it's possible, staff report address how whatever's being proposed is promoting that affordable housing goal whether it does or whether it doesn't, um, uh, if we can. Because um, I'd like to have, I'm learning and I'd, I'd like the benefit of the staff's report on that when, when we see these, because we're going to see more. Thank you. And that's all I have right now, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Okay, they'll huddle up over there. <laughs> Okay, well, yeah, Mr. Sh I'm just to address Mr. Miller's concern, I, certainly we can address that to the extent to which a current comp plan identifies that, whether it's compliant or not compliant. We, we try to evaluate all policies currently. So again, I, I, what I was huddling on was to, I haven't looked at the specific language in a little while, and we want to make sure 
any, any proposal address that specific language. So as it goes forward to the officials, the elected officials, that information will be there for them? It, we in the future we can include we'll make sure that any policy in the comp plan is, it, that's pertinent is addressed in the staff report okay all right thank you uh commissioner huff <clears throat> yeah i had something related to what uh commissioner winders uh was asking about and uh, maybe she asked it and it wasn't answered but i'm gonna ask it this way what is the mechanism for keeping housing affordable. I mean, you could start out with affordable housing, and if the property values go up or the demand becomes really great, what's to, what's to stop it from becoming very unaffordable? What kind of mechanism is there? Does anybody know? Anyone like to take a stab at uh, Commissioner's Health's question? I think if uh, if it's on like a federal grant or something like that, then like 20% of that property, if it's deemed under a federal grant, has to stay that way or you'll lose the funding or whatever you had. You know, generally speaking, nowadays there are uh, tax increment finances or special uh, finances that say that it has to stay this way for a certain period of time. And if, you know, they come in and find that a certain percentage is not affordable housing, then you'll lose that money that you got from the federal government. But in the private sector, I think it's pretty much private market rate driven. And so if the market rate deems it not to be affordable, then it wouldn't be affordable. That's just my educated guess. Yeah. Let me, uh, Pat Young again with the planning department. I'm not sure I heard all that question. I apologize. I was talking to my colleagues. Um, let, let me try to give two quick responses. I think Commissioner Davis is correct. If there is federal money in projects or certainly federal housing grants, there's certainly significant stipulations about affordability and how that's guaranteed long term. To my, the best of my knowledge, there's no federal money or state money or, or any governmental money involved in this project. And so I think none of those provisions would apply. Related to that, on the earlier comment about the housing policy, and I, I don't have the comp plan in front of me, my colleagues are going to be pulling it up for me, but I believe what the comp plan talks about is actions of the city's Department of Housing and Community Development and, and, and other um, city supported through federal and state funding uh, activity, housing activities. And again, that if that's the, indeed the case, and I'll confirm that, that wouldn't be germane to this project since it's not a, a city project. So again, I, does that address your concern? or, or was Yeah, it, it doesn't really answer it, but that's okay. What, what I was, mean, could I you mean, repeat I, the there question then? There doesn't seem to be in private development a mechanism to keep the housing affordable. There, there's, there's there? not. Okay, so I'm not sure why we're talking about it. Well, I, I mean, I, I am sure why we're let me, let me go ahead and say this. So, so I think everybody uh, on the commission knows the city is, um, because of the adopted uh, policy that uh, Ms. Seibel passed out, uh, the city is convening a kickoff workshop on August 20th to talk in detail about a four-part strategy to try to find uh, a tool, build a toolbox that will uh, identify mechanisms to uh, preserve and create affordable housing near transit areas and meet that goal. Uh, I, I, there's no way I can sit here today and say that's, that that's going to involve uh, a, any kind of, um, it, it, we certainly are contemplating incentives through the development mm -hmm. process, uh, but, but not um, any kind of mandatory uh, uh, mechanisms at this time. Uh, explicitly mandatory affordable housing is prohibited by law. Um, and I don't, we, I'm not, we're not at a point where we can jump to final solutions yet, but we're certainly going to kick off our approach and dig deep into those issues over the next year to try to address the policy goal Ms. Seibel outlined. I had one quick other thing. Um, the uh, bike lanes that you're not going to build, are you dedicating right away for that? Um, we have not been asked to do so. Uh, are you aware that the, um, the bicycle plan actually requests or um, calls for dedication of additional right-of-way for bike lanes? Well, I, I, does, I don't know. I don't think it does. I, okay. I, I, I know it that it's a, it's a subject. I'm on the Development Review Committee sure, for BPAC, sure. and it is a subject that comes up practically any time a development is mentioned, people hope that, that where uh, the bike plan would like to see in the future bike lanes that the developer would 
dedicate the right of way. And so I was just asking. Well, and, and, and if it's needed, we will. Um, uh, as we go through site plan for the next phases, uh, as you know, because I think you review right. the plans, that's when it yeah. comes up, and, and that's when there will be uh, a, a, a directive. If the bicycle plan de says dedicate additional right-of-way for these bike lanes, uh, we would do so at that time. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Gibbs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> just listening to the comments so far, uh, how to integrate uh, affordable housing in developments is another part of the puzzle. Uh, but in, in reviewing this, uh, this application, it seemed, I got the feeling that you know, this probably is the first uh, attempt at uh, development around, well, at least a proposed transit stop. And I was looking at it, and even though it's using infield development uh, more so than brand new, plant it from the bottom up. And I think everything is sort of in place, as far as I'm concerned, uh, for affordable housing uh, according to whatever percentage you can talk about, and, and that gets to be complicated too, doesn't it, staff? Uh, but the, the, the one question I have is, I don't know how far this circle goes, but there is a part of the neighborhood, and it's always, it has always been considered part of this whole neighborhood, all the way from the ambulatory surgery uh, uh, building at, at Duke, uh, across Irwin Road at the medical center, all up and down. And that's, it's a, a, a median income family neighborhood, single family development. It's the Crest Street area. Is it part of this, is it enclosed in this circle? And if so, has it been included as part of uh, affordable housing percentage uh, or, and I, I'm just curious about that. Uh, and I don't know if it would come from Dan or anybody that would enlighten me on whether it has been included and, and if it's, Okay. Mr. Gibbs, um, the Crest Street is part of the existing Duke University compact neighborhood, which is really most served by the, uh, the station to the proposed station to the east. As uh, the applicant, I think, stated, that these compact neighborhoods will probably all kind of merge together, but it would more than likely not be within the circle, the half mile circle of this station in front of this development. And Mr. Gibbs, just to clarify, uh, the, the numbers that we gave were strictly multifamily units, um, didn't include any, any single family units. Right. But there's something north of 3,000 multifamily units with, existing within that half mile circle. Yeah, and that, that seems to me to be a, I don't know how it works out percentage wise, but it's a good start. And I guess that, that's what complicates this particular development in that it is existing, um, but we going forward, we're going to have to do everything we can to come up with uh, ways of integrating affordable housing in developments wherever it is, but especially along the the transit corridor and the transit stops. Uh, thank you, Chair. Commissioner Freeman. Um, I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure that I make a comment to that Speaking in that. To the mic. Sorry. I make a comment to that in that um, it's important not only that we integrate it into our um, plans, but it's also important that we look at the inequity that comes out of it when we don't and how it has um, tracked back through history. So I'm also going to be voting against this. Um, as it currently stands, and I just want to make sure that we focus more on 
moving forward with a better plan on incorporating affordable housing because this is not it. And I have noticed a lot of increase in, at this, at this point it's just rentals, but um, the home values will increase, the properties will increase, everything increases and then folks are displaced. So I just wanna make sure that we're not um, overlooking that point. I know, I know density is very important and how we move forward is just, um, just not this way. So. Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't want to vote against this project, um, and I don't really think it's necessary. Um, I do think the time to start including serious commitments for affordable housing starts with this project, starts right now. This is the first big one since the council and the board of commissioners have adopted the resolution that lay out the criteria that, that they want. Uh, we are the policy arm of the advisors to them on, on projects like this against the policies that they've announced to us. Um, and so, because there is a lot of, of experience out there using federal subsidies and other things, just deciding what the, what's affordable and how to construct those commitments uh, and to evaluate them in the future against performance, uh, here the difference is, is we don't, we're not offering federal money, but this is a mixed-use development, and a mixed-use development has a development plan, and the development plan can have commitments, and those commitments, I believe, can include affordable housing. Uh, the council has laid out um, what it wants. Uh, uh, I think it is admirable. Uh, I'm willing to be reasonably flexible on those things, but at this stage, what I'd like to see is this development plan modified in 60 days to come back and say that we will have somewhere around 20 to 30 units. I mean, altogether, this is 322 units, but uh, some of those units are already on the ground. So if you measure against the increment of units to be built, which is 200 and some units, 218 according to the staff report, I'm not sure that's exactly the right number, but let's, let's use that number. These developers could come back with a committed element that said that as they build units, as they add residential units, a certain percentage of those would be offered at 60% at AMI for a certain number of years, 10 years. I know in some places they look at 15 years or 20 years, but 10 years. Let's get a start on this. Let's do it the first time. Let's do it now uh, and move forward that way. These developers are lucky in that they already have 70 plus units on the ground, two bedroom units on the ground that could serve a family of four. Uh, they've been on the ground for uh, 16, 17 years. Uh, so presumably they have uh, amortized a little bit to the developer's favor. Uh, I it would not bother me that as they add units, as they develop out their mixed use project, if they, as they add units, it's the units that wind up being affordable are the ones that are already built. Um, so let's look at that. I believe that we have, in the examples that we have uh, in other places, ways to construct a committed element that can advance affordable housing, be a model for projects in the future, and st we can start today. Let's not just keep saying next time in the future. The future is now. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, unless you think it's not appropriate, I would move that we delay this project for 60 days. Let's give this developer a chance to bring us back some ideas on how to address affordable housing okay. against the resolution adopted by the City Council. Before the Chair accepts this motion, are there any other commissioners that would like to speak on this item? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Davis. Um, I think it's unfair to the applicant for them to go through uh, another process, mainly because we've already talked about the fact hey, you, that... You're speaking to the motion. The motion is not on the floor yet. It's not on the floor? No, it's okay. not on the floor. I have not accepted the motion. Right. Well, can I, I'll make another motion. Can I make another motion at this point? Or? How long do we have applicants, I mean, commissioners that would like to speak to the 
application that's that's before the board, right? The, the commissioners right now. Right. Well, well, I was speaking to the applicant saying that while affordable housing is a need, I think it happens with public-private partnerships where the public in the city or the county, you know, help and massage this together. This is a totally private operation. Um, now we can ask him to look into that, but I, I just think it's not fair for him to. You know, we can't ask for committed elements and it's solely private. I think if this was a public-private operation, then we can look at it in that manner. I think we're trying to treat it as that. Um, and so that's why I would approve this at this point because of the nature of this project. Okay, Commissioner uh, Gibbs. Uh, for this is for the staff. Are there any guidelines that would require uh, or would address any kind of commitments that would become hard and fast? Yeah, Commissioner Gibbs, thank you for the question. Pat Young again with the Planning Department. Um, let me take a half a step back and then I'll answer your question directly. Um, to, to, uh, in terms of the policy context here um, versus whether we can accept a committed element, I will get to that in just a moment. There is, there are adopted a house, uh, there's an adopted objective of the comprehensive plan as Commissioner Miller alluded to regarding affordable housing enhancements. It has four parts. The first relates to a density bonus that's been in our ordinance for over 10 years and it's been ineffective, hasn't been used by, uh, by any app, any uh, developers. A second calls for the city to seek legal authority to get um, legal authority to apply mandatory for, uh, inclusionary zoning or affordable uh, mandatory inclusion of affordable housing that has not occurred the third talks about public-private partnerships um, through the city's community development department there have been many of those this is not one of those projects the fourth talks about energy efficient housing to be uh, encouraged by city uh, dollars through the department of community development the other policy context is the adopted um, resolution that Ms. Seibel passed out to you all and that you all are aware of um, which we are going to be begin assiduously identifying uh, tools and techniques uh, on how that would be accomplished. There was not any guidance in the resolution about exactly how those would, that would be accomplished, and that's what we're going to start evaluating as staff. As Commissioner Miller alluded to, you all have every authority uh, as a policy guiding advisory body to, to determine this is the right time to, to apply that. So Commissioner Miller is certainly correct in that regard. So I just want to be crystal clear about kind of where staff is at on that. Um, to your question, yes, there, there have been other uh, examples, uh, fairly limited, but there have been certainly of pro uh, proffer committed elements that tie, tie to mandatory uh, through a proffer, made mandatory through the proffer, uh, affordable housing. And depending on the specific language and the mechanism, which we would have to evaluate thoroughly, and I heard Commissioner Miller suggest 60 days, that, that w if, if something is submitted to, uh, is offered by the applicant, that would give us time to review it. Um, but uh, the certainly could, I can't say specifically until we know exactly what's going to be pro what would be proffered, if anything, in terms of uh, the precise terms, uh, because it, it would be to be dependent on the suggested mechanism for affordability. So, thank you all. Commissioner Gibbs, are you through? Okay, uh, I believe Commissioner Whitley. Boy, I, I just knew this was going to sail through. Um, it was my understanding that we were, as Commissioner Davis just said, that we were, that this would apply to public, private ventures, um, the affordable housing add-ons, um, and this is a private development, and this is, they already have buildings on the, I mean, it's built out on the land, and what they're proposing is to add on, but it still be private when they add on and to ask them to come back in 60 days, I'm not sure what changes will be. I mean, right now we don't even have a Please process. Please don't speak to a motion that's not on the floor. Okay. That's not on uh, the floor. All right. Um, 
I'm prepared to to vote for this um, based at this. It's a private development, um, and um, and I'm sure um, when we talk about vacant public private development, that's when we can talk about a 15 percent affordable housing. You through? Yes, through. Uh, Commissioner B. Bina. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if we heard uh, enough about the existing um, set of apartments that are currently affordable housing on that parcel. Um, are there plans to change those? The 71 existing units that were built in 1997, by our calculations, are well within the 80% AMI. Um, we've talked at length about whether those could be committed long term, and the answer is no. And the reason for that is those are covered under HUD financing and HUD insurance. And the contract with HUD would preclude them from agreeing to a committed element which bound it to that. And that's the sole reason. And that's, that is the reason I, I talked about the long history of the Everett family and their 60 plus years of creating affordable housing in this neighborhood. Not just the Poplar Apartments, but Holly Hill Apartments and uh, Campus Walk Apartments, all of which are well within that 8% AMI. So what I'm hearing tonight is, even though this family has a long demonstrated history of doing good for the Durham community and doing good from a standpoint of uh, doing what's right rather than what's in their best financial interest, that I'm hearing that there's a matter of trust that they're not going to continue to do that and that they're going to um, uh, you know, do something bad for the Durham community. And, and that's why... Um, I'm, I'm uh, if we came back two months from now, I don't think our answer would be any different than it is today for that very reason. As I said, we have over 60% affordable housing already in this half mile radius. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jewell. Uh, okay, so the answer to the question is that there is no long term commitment to keep those apartments there and keep them affordable. There cannot be. Affordable. And Commissioner Winers, I think you had a question. I'd like to, uh, uh, you're uh, asked Pat um, about, um, you know, uh, as you were reading out about the incentive um, uh, that has never been used. Um, it made me think, uh, if this, if the, what would the impact of the, of, the con of, of uh, not extending the compact neighborhood tier be on the allowed density of this development? I'll have Mr. Whiteman give you the, the details on that. I think it was in Ms. Wolf's presentation. You might but, have uh, asked that before, answered that before, but it didn't quite register. Uh, Ms. Winders, the existing zoning would allow a total of 104 units, so there's uh, there's actually some, I believe, some residential units in the, uh, other than in the, the 72 and the, the rear. So it's, and, it's, and it's close now, to being maxed out. It's mixed unit, uh, I mean, mixed use in the, in the urban tier now, right? That's correct. Yeah, so, uh, so if, that, if the um, compact neighborhood tier were not extended, then one option would be to use the density bonus to get more units and, in, and include some affordable housing. Is that correct? It is without checking the details, it's definitely theoretically correct. Maybe the reason that the density bonus is not used is because the, it's not needed. The, the density is already so high that you never have to use it. No wonder it's never been used. 
Okay, are there addition? Okay, if not, yes. I just wanted to ask Dan if I'm correct when you say 60% of the existing housing is at 80% affordable rather than 60%, which is in the proposed, oh, I'm sorry, in the, uh, so, in the uh, resolution. So to, to clarify, at least 62% of the existing multifamily units within the half mile circle meet the 80%. I'm not exactly sure what the 60% rent number would be. Pat, I don't know if you have that, whether it's a linear projection, but I suspect that a very good percentage of those actually meet the 60% as well. So if I might, Ms. Freeman and members of the commission, um, as I think Mr. Jewell alluded to, most federal programs through the Department of Housing and Urban Development refer to the 80% threshold. The city policy about affordable housing near transit re reflected 60. So the, um, Mr. Jewell, I think, correctly referenced um, the 80%, uh, the, the HUD guideline is you should spend no more than 30% of your income on, on housing and utilities, whether that's rent or mortgage. Um, that's about $1,050 at 80%, and in the 820, 830, I might be off by $10 either direction for at 60 percent just making sure 30 percent of your salary like if you're making 27 5 or I'm sorry what's the other number right you're considered housing burdened if you're spending more than 30 percent of or your 39 income. 4 if you're spending more than 30 percent you're above that 60 percent so there, there we're, we're talking about two different things the um, 30% of your income at any income level, if you're spending over 30%, you're considered housing burden. You're spending more uh, on, on housing than HUD's guidelines indicate is financially healthy for you to have money for other needs, uh, savings, et cetera. Um, so the, I guess the question comes down to the 80%, which is recognized for most federal programs as the qualification where it constitutes low, moderate income. And, I and just, the, the city policy was in the county policy was 60% of median income. And I'm, I'm just just asking the question, would that only be applied to public private partnerships and not private no, development? I, I'm, I'm no, those, those, those criteria, um, those criteria apply across the board. They're based on area median income. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mr. Young, Pat, if I could get a clarification. Did, did you say what you think the 60% AMI rent number is without utilities? Yes, so the, the rent plus utilities number is approximately $830 a month. I, again, that may be off by 10 or $20 either direction. I, don't, I, can okay. get, I should be able to get it while we're still in this hearing. Thank but. you. So I have all the numbers in front of me of the average rent of all the apartment uh, complexes in, in apartment neighborhoods within this half mile zone. And if I simply take out um, the number of units that are in excess of that rental amount of the affordable amount. Uh, handy to have a calculator here. Fifty-nine percent of those units are at sixty percent AMI. And I am happy to share this chart um, with uh, the staff and uh, the uh, chair if you'd like. I would like. Thank All you. All right. Thank you. Okay, uh, Tom, you have a question? Okay, if there's no other comments, uh, the chair will entertain a motion. I move. Mm -hmm. There's no motion. I move that we approve A13. Zero 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 one zero for adoption. Motion by Commissioner Whitley, second by Commissioner Davis, that tax amendment A one three zero 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 one zero be approved. All those in favor of this motion, let it be known by a show of hands. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I have a substitute motion. State your substitute motion. My substitute motion again is to delay action on these two items, the plan amendment and the rezoning, for 60 days so that we can give these developers a chance to come back to us with some sort of commitment. Because we've talked about 
some sort of commitment on public housing that approximate matches or or approaches the goal expressed by the city council in the resolution that they adopted uh, a couple of months ago. Now, they may not want to do that. Okay, let's not speak to the motion, just state, the, state well, the motion. Then I'd like to speak to the motion before we vote. Okay. Uh, we have a motion to delay this vote for a six a day continuance. Second. And we have a second by commissioner. Now, Mr. Mil Mr. Miller would like to speak since he's the motion maker and then followed by you. I know these developers may not want to do this, uh, but there comes a point where we as a community actually has, have to start, stop talking about affordable housing and start insisting on affordable housing. Uh, the statistics that have been given about that the rents in the half mile radius are affordable, none of that is committed. None of that necessarily is gonna change. I have to say that it's always worried me that our AMI figure includes Chapel Hill, which I think skews the number considerably. Uh, this developer, as all developers do when they ask for a zone change, are asking for a considerable benefit from the public, from the people of the city of Durham, rezone my property to something that allows me to do more. And when we give that, when we grant that application, then I don't think it's unreasonable for us to expect that, the, that what is being proposed, especially when it's on a large scale, that it promote our overall goals. And one of those goals uh, expressed it as a goal in the comprehensive plan, and now a little bit more uh, expressly in this resolution adopted by the council, is, is that we get serious about affordable housing it can be done. It can be done. And if the, I invite these developers to consider how they can do it. It doesn't necessarily have to meet this criteria. Let's, it's, a big, it's a point of beginning. Uh, and if they come back in 60 days and say they can't do it, then we can evaluate it at that time. But 60 days, I think, since we have sprung this whole idea of affordable housing on them in the last hour here today and and maybe the last few days as people have communicated with the developer, myself included, about our concern about affordable housing, let's give them some time to hash this out and be the first developer, since this resolution has been adopted, the first developer to come back and say, sign us up, we want to be on board, this is what we can do in a commitment for affordable housing, especially when you consider who works at Duke University, it's doctors, it's all kinds of professors, it's all sorts of professionals, but it's also the people who keep the place clean, who mow the grass, and all these other people. If right now, a lot of those people have to drive clear across town or take the bus. I would like for them to be able to walk to their place of employment. I would like for them to be able to get on the transit and ride to their place of work. This is the time, this is the point where we start talking seriously. I urge you to vote for this uh, motion. Okay, uh, Commissioner Whitley, speak to the substitute motion that's on the floor of a six-a-day continuous. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, would you allow a colloquy between um, Miller and I? I have a question. Uh, the question is to the chair. What's your question? Will you allow a conversation I, I want to ask Commissioner the Miller question. Our questions is to the chair. If I need Mr. Miller to answer, I'll ask him to answer. <laughs> All right. Um, right now, the way I understand it, that a 60-day delay would mean that they would have to pay another fee to come back. Is that correct? And that would go to the staff. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and Reverend Whitley. Um, if the item is continued, which I think I heard the chair specifically say, and, and Mr. Miller not object, uh, rather than deferred, there would be no re-advertising required. We would be continued to a date certain. The current advertising would apply, and there would be no new uh, costs associated with advertising or, or owed to the city um, for the continuance. I'm good. Commissioner Gibbs. I, I'm in agreement with with you, Tom, and 
and you, Commissioner. Uh, except what we have as far as guidelines is this resolution. Is it not, it is not a law of zoning. That's all it is, right? But I am in total agreement. We do need to move forward with affordable housing. And I'm directing my comments to those who are elected officials and anybody else who can put pressure on getting us moving forward. We can argue this saying you can come back 60 days, 120 days. Your property is going to remain the same and what your goals are, are going to remain the same. Uh, this is in this first step, and I do consider this a first step in, in what's happening with around, around the transit stops. Uh, it's, it is what it is. And I, in the resolution, uh, we ask people, developers, to uh, in the future provide more uh, affordable housing, which is something I, I think you could do. Uh, how that's going to work with it being rental property, if it were, well, if it were rental property. Uh, but I, I, I just can't see putting this off except to get the powers that be moving on setting some hard and fast rules and how it's going to be done. Nobody knows at this point, but at any rate, uh, those, are, those are my comments. And, and I think I just heard somebody say there are meetings coming up that the public should attend and have their input and put pressure on everybody concerned because it is an issue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I see no other interest, so I'm going to <clears throat> call for a vote of the substitute motion to extend this request or continue this request for 60 days or two cycles. All those in favor of this motion, please raise your hand. All those opposed, please raise your right hand. Right, so since the substitute motion passed, there, there's no action taken on the initial motion. Right. Okay. So that, that appeared to pass 10 to 2. Is that what you got, Juliet? Okay, so the substitute motion passed 10 to 2, that this item would be continued for 60 day or two cycles. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> we have. Mr. Chair, you also need to uh, oh, okay. make a, take action on the zoning case. I think the motion included both of them. No, he yeah. did a motion for both. He included both in his motion. Okay. Madam Clerk, would you read the substitute motion? If, as long as the um, Mr. Miller's motion included reference to both cases, there's no further action required. He did. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> now we will move down to item number seven A, which is a public hearing of zoning map change request for the handover point sub area C, Z one four zero 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 four.
Good evening, Amy Wolf with the Planning Department. Again, this is case Z140004, Hanover Point sub area C. The applicant is Lennar Carolinas LLC. It is within the city's jurisdiction and the request is from planned development residential at a density of 4.760 to planned development residential 4.000. The site is 13.96 acres and the uh, proposal is for 41 single family residential units. The site is one parcel at 1030 McLam Drive. It is in the suburban tier. Again, it's in the city. It's in the FJB watershed protection overlay. There are, um, there's a, a similar residential density surrounding this property uh, with uh, rural residential zoning, rural, residential suburban 20 zoning, as well as similar densities of planned development residential densities. The, re the request for the PDR, or planned development residential district, does meet the standards of our, minimum standards of our ordinance. Uh, the, some of the standards are listed here in this table. The standards that are applicable to the development plan that we'll show you. Here's the existing site. There is a sh stream on the eastern portion of the site. It does have an associated floodplain and steep slopes. There are uh, three areas of wetlands through the center of the site. There is dedicated right away through the site, although the, um, the pavement is, has not been uh, there to connect it. The proposed conditions show two development envelopes, one on either side of the uh, right away. There are um, three access points, one on either side of the, of the right of way that extends McLam Drive, as well as another uh, cross access on the northern portion of the site. There's a number of commitments as well. Uh, the commitment is for 41 residential units, or single family residential units. Um, there's, again, three set access points, 70% uh, maximum impervious surface, that's maximum allowed in the FJB watershed protection overlay, and 20.3% tree coverage. There's one text commitment to uh, have the housing type as single family. The request is consistent with the future land use map of our comprehensive plan, which designate the site as low to medium density or four to eight units an acre, as well as the green represented on the west as recreation and open space. The request is consistent with the, develop, um, with the comprehensive plan and the applicable policies, and staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Staff is available to answer any questions. I have, <clears throat> excuse me, three people signed up to speak. I have one definitely for, one definitely against, and I have one that's kind of on the fence. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Mr. Robert Shaw. Uh, you have, I'm going to say 10 minutes. Which button do I push over here? That one. Two. Amy? It's not working. <laughs> one, two. Uh oh. I just said escape. There we go. Would you reset the clock? I'm trying to think where I am. D uh, Jacob, did you put this file on here? Is it, is it that one? Oh, there it is. Sorry. It's, it's in the cloud. F5. F5. Um, good evening, uh, commissioners. My name is Robert Schunk. I live at uh, 2627 University Drive here in Durham, uh, here representing Lennar Homes. Um, 
some of you may be wondering, uh, I'll give you some history a little bit. Um, we rezoned this site back in 2006. Um, this was uh, the development plan that we had proposed. Uh, if you look here, uh, this is our site that we're here for tonight. The site in 2006 also included this tract of land as well as this tract of land over here. Uh, both these two tracts are currently under development um, today. Uh, the re reason we are here today uh, for this site is for one reason only, and that is to re uh, remove uh, some traffic improvements uh, that were uh, previously uh, required by Brightleaf when uh, Brightleaf was uh, having a proposed entrance here opposite um, Ashton Glen Road. Um, this uh, was a committed element uh, required of um, Ashton Hall and, and Ellington Place. Well, Hanover Point was formerly called Ellington Place. After these two projects were rezoned and approved, the NCDOT denied a driveway access at this red arrow. Okay, um, moving forward, uh, talking with transportation staff and planning staff, um, and with our traffic consultant, the left turn lane into this development obviously could not be built because there's no turn lane to turn into. So therefore, uh, the only um, avenue to remove those commit elements were to come back uh, for a rezoning. No other uh, things with this project have changed. Um, as Amy alluded to before, the zoning was 4.76. That included the overall project. Uh, we are rezoning to, uh, to uh, four units uh, per acre. Um, the road connections that um, Amy showed in her staff report are, are essentially the same, where we are making the same connection that was required and committed to back in 2006 here. Um, as part as required by the ordinance for connectivity and we're also making this the stub here to this parcel that is landlocked um, everything else that we did in 2006 that we are doing now is exactly the same same locations of tree coverage here and here same buffers and all where we're asking for an approval to remove those uh, road improvements that are no longer required because of the change of context of the driveway I have here with me a traffic engineer that uh, did a traffic study, uh, Ronald Stevenson, if you have any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, it was 712 that was left on the floor. Okay, so against I have Greg Stock. Greg, you have 10 minutes. My name is Greg Stocking, and I live at 1014 McLam Drive, which is just a couple of lots. Uh, I guess that would be on the top of the map, but uh, it's part of the continuation of the road, which is what is it, Willow Crest Road, which they plan on connecting to McLam Drive. Um, I'm not necessarily against what they're asking to do. Um, my concern is I had just moved into the property, I guess, when all this uh, originally happened, so I wasn't really privy to any of the zoning that had happened prior to this. And I know that, I guess, in talking to some real estate people, that there's a overriding uh, uh, zoning rule that uh, as new subdivisions are built, they need to be connected to existing subdivisions and not just terminated and kept separate. So I realize that uh, it is probably a done deal that the Willowcrest Willow Crest Road will connect to McLam. Um, and this may not be the right forum to point this out, but um, the problem that we have as residents, uh, and several of us are here tonight, um, is that McLam Drive is just not designed to handle um, the amount of traffic that will be generated um, by connecting that road through, um, both with the existing uh, development that's already been happened and then the, and the additional, what was it, 41 more units um, that are going to be put in in that area. Um, the road is fairly well deteriorated as it is now, and I, know, I, don't, I haven't heard any plans that as part of this development that they're going to fix that problem. Um, secondarily, it's not really clear on the map here, but it would appear, if you don't look very closely, that the uh, McLam Drive goes straight through through Rikon Place to connect to uh, um, um, Holder Road, and it doesn't. <laughs> uh, 
There is no straight through, so what will happen here is people will come down McLam Drive, turn on Bristol Wood, and then turn on Danbury effectively to go through there. Um, that is going to generate a, 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 a tremendous amount of traffic for a road that is not by any means stretch designed for that kind of traffic. Um, so my concern, and again, this may not be the right forum to bring this up, is um, you know, I realize that there's a, again, there's an outstanding uh, uh, statute or whatever to connect these subdivisions, um, but I fear that if we look at the development, everything is cul-de-sac except uh, the one road that goes out through High Fox Drive, um, which is right literally next door to us, to, you know, one road over from where we're at. Um, and uh, I, I just, I'm, I'm afraid, I have a, you know, four-year-old child, I'm, I'm afraid of uh, the amount of traffic, because right now we're on a dead-end road, so we get, you know, practically no traffic except for residents. Um, how much traffic that's going to open up, and that's really a concern to me. Um, secondarily, the road can't sustain it. It, it just won't do it. It's just not built for it, and it's, it will need some major modifications in order to handle that kind of traffic. Um, I mean, they're looking at 40, you, and you know, the majority of the people that would be going out through that road would, I, my guess would be, um, they would be heading or wanting to head to either Mineral Springs or to um, Stallings Road. Um, you know, nowhere in the plan, at least not that I've seen or have, um, do I see them connecting through the land that they made as part of this plan, you know, a direct, more direct route onto Mineral Springs, which is one of the major thoroughfares that people would be trying to get to. There's, you know, unless you're going to visit somebody, there would be no reason to go through our neighborhood to get to Holder, because once you get to Holder, you're either visiting some, there's nothing there, you're either going to go left to go up to Mineral Springs, or you're going to go right to go to Stallings to get anywhere. Um, it's not like that road would continue on to 98 or any of the other major roads. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a very residential area, very residential road, again, never developed to, or never designed to handle that kind of traffic. Um, so I'm, I have a concern there, and again, this may not be the right forum to bring that up. Um, if, if it does, in fact, end up going through, I would, you know, I'll pursue avenues of trying to get speed bumps put in or whatever else we can do and get road improvements done that would, number one, uh, be able to handle this, and number two, make it less desirable as a, uh, I guess a lot of people use the term cut through um, <laughs> to, uh, you know, for people to try to cut off time to get, you know, one way or the other. Um, and again, I'm just a concerned citizen who owns some land and a home on there and have children and things, and uh, I'm just worried about the, that connection. I'm really not worried about the, the density or, or um, you know, there's a lot of uh, runoff area back there, so there will be some greenway and stuff like that. So I'm not really concerned about that it's just going to be, you know, solid houses and no trees and all that kind of thing, because there's a lot of, um, I, in fact, part of my property is a uh, um, sewer easement that I can't develop on, can't do anything about, and that's perfectly fine. I have no problem with that. Um, it's just the, the, the issue for, with me is the road and the, and the amount of traffic that this thing's going to generate when that, when that goes through. And again, this may not be the right form for, for doing that. And if it's not, then if anybody could tell me what the right form is, I'd really appreciate that because I'd like to pursue that along with my neighbors. Um, so I appreciate your time and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Okay, thank you. And uh, I have uh, Jericho Holland Moore. <coughs> And Jericho, you have seven minutes and twelve—I mean, seven minutes and twelve seconds for, and four minutes and forty-seven <laughs> seconds against. All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, to start my four part, uh, I am uh, for as far as the zoning and like uh, the gentleman before me said. I don't know if this is the right forum. Um, but I am for the zoning as far as the lower density. I mean, you can drop the density as low as you want. That would be great um, to me because it, cause obviously it's uh, helping improve the values around there. My house, uh, by the way, my name is Jericho Alamore, located 11 Faircroft Court. Um, it's not listed on this map that was sent out to us, but it is uh, the unnamed court right there in the middle of Glenview Lane. Um, and the reason that uh, I was speaking here tonight um, it one uh, one the other representing the other concerned citizens out here. Um, they want to let me notify uh, y'all as well. Um, and I again, I think you have to access the property. So I don't know if if this can be addressed or if this is the correct forum. But Willowcrest um, people already do fly across that road. They cut through High Fox Drive. 
Um, so obviously now that it goes straight through, that's definitely going to be a thoroughfare. So that's just something to keep in mind if that affects anything. Um, my concern is uh, the trees. Earlier, one of the staff mentioned that there were um, 26 percent coverage on the on the property and it, I would say by my definition it's like a hundred percent covered the the property does have trees all across it um, I didn't know how to submit a handy dandy PowerPoint so I'll pass along my iPad if that's uh, legal here in this forum and uh, on that on that uh, and actually it's a Samsung not iPad I'm sorry for that um, it is it shows some pictures of the trees along the property. You'll see pictures that I'm not standing in uh, are pictures of the center of the property, so there's a number of trees. But my main concern, uh, the reason I'm not concerned or wouldn't be concerned about density is because if there was, currently there's no, um, there's no buffer or anything along that southern line as you're looking at this map that we received. Along the south line, uh, along Glenview, there's there's no buffer, and we went in there. Uh, we purchased property. We had asked about that, um, and so we knew that going in. But um, just everybody likes trees. I think everybody would say, if I could have a 40-foot tall tree in my property, I'd rather have it as opposed to um, just clearing all the trees. Um, so I I I've put together four points. Uh, which I believe support uh, just a small buffer, uh, 20 to 25 feet of neutral zone, which uh, those houses or the developer on that side would not be able to um, build, that there would be trees that would remain there. Uh, one would to be to protect, there are a few old growth trees. If you look at those pictures, they're like 40 foot tall. Um, you know, everybody likes to walk down our court to look at the trees. Uh, and so they, they do provide a beautiful buffer along there. Um, and we do have trees on our side of the property. So my concern is if the developer goes in there, either raises the soil or undercuts the soil, undercuts the soil, they cut the roots, you know, covers over the soil, they destroy uh, the, the roots um, and, and mess up the drainage. Number two is to prevent erosion. Um, the trees do line a drainage ditch. Uh, one of those pictures, I'm standing in the drainage ditch uh, the drainage ditch is about the furthest point of it in the front of my house. It's about 15 feet off the property line. I'm guesstimating because there's no actual line, obviously. Um, but I would say it's about 15 feet away that that drainage ditch goes. And so those trees line that. They prevent erosion um, and it obviously maintain the integrity of the soil. Number three, uh, to protect the property values. I just got a beep. Um, to protect the property values, this is uh, obviously promotes tax revenue in the in the county of Durham. Um, I know you guys get your taxes because I, I pay quite a bit, uh, but I, so I want to protect the property values of the of the houses. Obviously, my house um, and the and my neighbors around there. Uh, I think if you have this density, if you look at the density, uh, another thing the staff said was that um, there are similar densities around. I would consider it pretty different. If you look at our density, it's 2.72. Uh, the density over there, uh, as pr proposed, would be 4.0, which is obviously better than 4.6, but obviously a lot more than 2.72. Um, so I think a tree buffer would, would minimize the uh, negative effect on our property values. Uh, number four, it provides a wildlife easement and access to the water source. That creek back there is a, a pretty decent sized creek and wildlife do travel uh, in those woods down to the creek. Um, I've seen deer, I've seen foxes, obviously there's plenty of birds um, and I'm sure there's rabbits in there, but uh, wildlife definitely use that. I see them walking across there. If we cut out all the trees, there's no access for wildlife to, the, um, to that creek below. So whether or not that's an option, I don't know, but I just wanted to voice my opinion um, as to uh, the benefit of neutral zone in that area. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other members in the audience that would like to speak to? All right, if not, then I'll close the public hearing and bring the matter back before the commissioners. Do we have commissioners that would like to speak? I have. Commissioner Miller, uh, Commissioner Huff.
Okay, Commissioner Miller. I just wanted to start. Pardon me, I just wanted to start with some questions. Uh, sir, I'm sorry I didn't get your last name. First name's Greg. Stocking. Stocking. Uh, can you, who maintains the streets in your subdivision? Is it, or do you, do you have like a homeowners association or are they publicly maintained? Sir, if you're going to speak, you need to come to the to the podium. Commissioner Miller, may I attempt to address that? Sure, please. The the um, to the best of my knowledge, and Bill Judge with transportation is here. They are um, they're DOT NCDOT streets. NC they may DOT. not be, and they may not have been accept, accepted yet. Well, they're, that's what that's what was worrying me because this wasn't city jurisdiction, and there aren't any county streets. So, you you were referring to the third gentleman that was. Um, Oh, um, the, McClam Drive and McClam, uh, okay. Recon yeah, McClam, and Danbury. Okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, McClam, those are all those are all DOT maintained streets, to my knowledge. Okay. Um, yeah. And then I have a question for the developer. Um, your development plan says you're committing to single family. Yes, sir. Which is not necessarily what a PDR is all about, but it can be. Was your uh, development plan in the PDR that you have today, does it also commit to single family? Yes. Okay. And I would like to know, because your your plan itself doesn't show the lot layout the way you did on the screen, um, how are you coping with those wetland areas? What's required there? How do you propose to manage those? The uh, We have had uh, the core out there uh, to uh, identify two, uh, three wetland pockets. Um, they are located, um, I don't have the, the current development plan up, but right now we are preserving those wetland areas uh, that he's speaking of what's been delineated from the core. So I see them here. Um, well, how are you working the lots around that was my question since I don't have a, a kind of a lot land. Or, are you, or you, have you not decided yet exactly where your uh, lots are going to be? We've done some conceptual, we've done some layouts on it. The, um, the wetland pockets are in, if you're looking at the screen here, are in this area right here. So mm -hmm. this road here is basically in the same location. So that is, is to the east of those wetlands. And then this roadway here, um, you know, essentially the site is pretty um, dictates that, you know, we'll need to have a road here. And of course we spoke about that. So the one wetland is north of this road and then there's another wetland pocket up in here. So we're avoiding them. Can you tell me what, you th what the basic lot dimensions are? Uh, 50 to 60 feet wide. And to, to, to talk about the density more, we had spoken to the planning department about trying to rezone it to a lower density. Our goal was to um, have some larger lots in there to mm -hmm. be similar to Ashton Hall. We had, and we had rezoned Ashton Hall back in 2005 as well. It was formerly called Quail Creek. Um, and then the second subsequent year, we rezoned this piece here. Um, um, but uh, from the planning department, the issue was was that the comp plan calls for four to eight units an acre. Uh, they had communicated to us that, you know, in order to gain support, we would need to maintain the four units an acre instead of, you know, try to request a comp plan. I understand. Uh, that's a pretty dramatic piece of property. I tramped around in there. I hope you don't mind. Uh, it's very high up, and then it's very low. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're right, the, none of the roads do what the map says they do. That's a hard place to find. Uh, so, but thank you, those are my questions, Mr. Chairman. Okay, let me apologize to Mr. Greg out there because we are on television and without you being at the spotted party and speaking into the mic, they can't hear what you're saying, nor can they get you a visual. So that's why I asked you to come to the mic if you wanted to speak. Okay, and we have Commissioner Huff. Um, yeah, I, I wanted some further clarification because you went pretty fast, Mr. Uh, Stock, Stocking, um, about the way that one would have to travel to access, uh, to go in and out of this property, how it would go, th exactly how it would go through the neighbors, neighborhoods. Maybe we could put a map up and he could point. Do we have somebody? Um, from the the drawing that I have or the, the layout I have, um, Willowcrest Drive right now stops at the edge of this pr um, proposed 
um, zoning change, and McLam Drive stops at the other end, um, and they are. Do I have a mouse? Okay. Uh, I've asked Ms. Wolf to pull up the context map, which the commissioners have as attachment one. <laughs> there it is. It's a mouse. Okay. So um, right now, here's where the uh, existing road dead ends um, with the existing development. Um, I live right over here on McLam Drive, and McLam dead ends in, at the other end of the development. If this road were to be connected, Traffic would come down here through McLam Drive, and it would need to turn here on Bristolwood. Um, this map implies that this other road, Rikon Place, is actually straight through. It's not. It goes very low, and there's a stream through there, and a little wooden bridge, but there's no... It, in fact, once you get... Whoops. I go the other way? There we go. Sorry. Um, once you get uh, just, I guess this is north of Bristolwood here, this is actually a gravel road. And it goes down into the bottom and dead ends. And then Rikon Place comes the other end. It's paved, but it just dead ends at the other end of this woods that a stream goes through. So there is that road does not connect through. So in, in other, uh, um, continue on. You come out McLam Drive. You'd have to turn right here on Bristolwood, and then you would have to turn left on Danbury. And it goes a little bit past where the map here shows. And it, uh, uh, Danbury dead ends at um, Mc, uh, Holder Road. Um, this other road that you see here, Bristolwood, if you continue going out here, once it gets past, uh, what is that, Alistair, it uh, actually turns into a gravel road and dead ends. Um, if you turn down Alistair, it actually goes up here a little bit, makes a 90 degree turn to the left, and dead ends at Danbury and comes back out. So bottom line, this entire development of Alistair, Bristolwood, Danbury, McLam, there is one entrance, one exit, and that is uh, Danbury Road, and it dumps out onto Holder Road. And that's it. It's a, it's a dead end community, no outlet other than that one outlet. Um, and I believe that the other gentleman who was actually living on uh, Glenwood had mentioned that he's already seeing a lot of traffic uh, that used the high, what is it, high, 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 high Fox Drive as a cut through. Um, ours would actually probably be even a little more direct um, than that cut through. And again, that would scare me as far as the amount of traffic and the, the, the congestion and stuff. Um, it, the, uh, the road that you dump out on a holder, a lot of people go, uh, if you go left, that'll turn out on the Mineral Springs. Um, that is already a very, very, very congested intersection. Uh, no light, just, you know, you stop. Uh, uh, holder has a stop light and then, or a stop sign, and Mineral Springs is just straight through. Comes right out of an S curve, actually, right there. Um, there's accidents there at least once a month, um, people pulling out and getting hit, um, and adding, adding more traffic to that, I, I just would think it was a very bad idea. Um, and going the other way on Holder to um, Stallings Road is also a pretty, it's right there at a church, uh, a Grove Park, um, but anyhow, it's, it's, it's got quite a bit of congestion there too, so sending a lot more traffic in either of those directions um, would require changes. And yes, we are not in the city. We are actually part of the county. So we were asking, I think, about road maintenance and all that kind of stuff. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, Did that clarify Lynn? your question? Yeah, yeah thanks. Yes. We good? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Winders. I just wanted to ask one more question. If you would explain what happens when you go on High Fo Fox Drive, does Pinnock or Pinnock Road where do, does that go out to Sharon or Holder? <laughs> Eventually, that does go out to Holder Road. Okay. So there are kind of two ways to get out. I, I when I went there and drove all around, and it is the most maze, labyrinthine <laughs> place I've ever been. I, you know, is there any chance that it might be? I'm sure it sounds like there probably isn't, <laughs> unless it gets taken into the city <laughs> to get the roads system rationalized and in any way. I don't think they can reroute the roads. <laughs> um, but one other uh, comment I did have, if the, if the developer wanted a lower density and we would be happy with a lower density and this would limit the traffic on the road, I mean, would that be a possibility? 
I can't. I think he answered that, and they would not allow him to go in the lower with the density. Who, the developer did. Who is they? The developer. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Chair, uh, I guess to clarify that is the comprehensive plan for this area recommends a density of four to eight units an acre. So anything less than four would not be compliant with the comprehensive plan. So the comprehensive plan cannot be changed. <laughs> yeah, anything can be changed, yes. <laughs> Pat Young with the Planning Department. The, the comprehensive plan, can, plan can be changed. The applicant would have to petition to do that. Okay. And it's likely staff would not recommend approval. They could still pursue it. Okay, are there any additional questions of commissioners? If not, the chair will entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Miller. Um, I move that we approve the rezoning in uh, this case, which I believe is 14-4. Um, and I'd like to speak to the motion. We have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Miller and a second by Commissioner Davis. The chair will now entertain uh, comments to the motion. A reason for making this motion in this case is, is as the developers pointed out there already, the, the zoning on the parcel today is 4.76 units per acre. This is actually a small down zoning. They've gone to the absolute rock bottom that they could do in the comprehensive plan. And while they could get a comprehensive plan change, we would be making a comprehensive plan change for, a, for 10 acres out of a large area that's covered by this four to eight uh, unit density. Uh, and uh, since the whole reason for this rezoning has to do with extremely remote traffic considerations that have gone away, um, I personally, although I do sympathize with all the neighborhood speakers who spoke today, believe that uh, consistent with, with what is for Durham a pretty low uh, number of units per acre, uh, in a environmentally uh, uh, difficult site where they are reserving space. I mean, I don't know what percentage of your property is not going to be buildable because of this, but by my own calculation, it looked like it was between 25 and 30 percent. Um, it seems to me that this rezoning is actually incrementally better than what's on the ground today and the issues that we've talked about today, although I it might be nice to have fewer units per acre there than what's proposed. Uh, really what has driven us to this uh, convocation are, are traffic improvements that no longer obtain. So I'll be voting for this reason. I see no other commissioners wishing to speak to this motion. So the motion on the floor is to approve zoning case 1400004. All in favor of this motion, let it be known by showing your right hand. All those in opposition? Case C1400004 has passed 12 to 0. <clears throat> now the chair will open the public hearing for zoning case Redendo Drive. Redendum Drive is Z zero, I mean Z one four zero 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 one zero. Thank you again, Amy Wolf with the Planning Department. This is a zoning map change request, Rhododendron Drive for KZ1400010. The applicant is B Prop LLC. It is actually in the county. We don't see many of those. This, this case is in the county, 9.706 acres. The request is from the present designation of Science Research Park to Residential Suburban 20, and the proposed use is for one single family dwelling unit. The site is in the suburban tier, in the, again, in the county's jurisdiction at 159 Rhododendron Drive. It's between Vintage Hill Parkway to the south and La Blobly Drive to the north in Treyburn. There's a residential zoning district surrounding the site. 
You'll notice on this context map also that surrounding the site is the city's jurisdiction. What is represented in gray is the county's jurisdiction. Uh, the site is within the FJB watershed protection overlay. There's a railroad, railroad corridor adjacent to the site on the south and west, as well as a 150-foot Duke power easement uh, adjacent to the Duke, Duke, excuse me, adjacent to the railroad, but on the site. The requ request does satisfy the requ minimum requirements of the RS-20 zoning district, as demonstrated here. Based on, and uh, our analysis was a little bit complicated in this case since it's a county case where uh, we're assuming no utilities are being provided. So based on the county requiring one acre um, for a septic, uh, um, the applicant could develop nine lots. Um, if utilities were provided typically in an RS-20 district in the city's jurisdiction, it could be 19 lots at two units an acre. Um, there are other factors to consider in this case. It's an, uh, a little background. The request is consistent with the future land use map, which shows this area as low density residential, which is four dwelling units an acre or less. And it is also consistent with the comprehensive plan policies that are applicable to the site. There's a number of adopted plans also that uh, encumber the site. Uh, the Long Range Bicycle Plan shows a greenway to the west, the Little River Corridor Open Space Plan, and the Durham Trails and Greenway and the Durham Thoroughfare Plan all have um, re relate to this site. Uh, there are no, there's no development plan attached to this site. There's no specific recommendations for the open space plan um, that encumbers this site. And the Durham thoroughfare plan shows a future extension of Traburn Parkway uh, along the north of this site. So staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. And staff is available for any questions. Thank you, Amy. And I have one person signed up to speak, and Dixon Pitt. Good evening. Thank you. I'm just here if anybody has any questions. Thank you. Okay. Do we have anyone from the audience that would like to speak to? Yes, sir. If you would. <coughs> Come to the podium, state your name, address, and then fill this out before you go back to your seat. No, no, you can you can speak now. Are you speaking in favor or against? Against. Okay. Uh, my name is Bernard Zabrowski. I reside at 609 Red Cedar Circle in Durham, in the area we're talking about. Um, we have, as residents have concerns about this. Um, may I say that part of the term moving into the area in Traburn and going up Road at Engine Drive was the uh, wooded area driving up there. And I understand that this, you know, is not a sacrosanct uh, thing, but it is was part of the charm of buying into the neighborhood. Um, one of our main concerns is if this house is allowed to be built, and I'm understanding that right now it is. I guess scheduled for one house. Um, what's to keep the developer from adding more houses onto the? Um, and this is a major concern of the people in the neighborhood. Um, it's not a huge area, uh, and will be seen by a lot of other houses. Um, what we have? Will he keep his word? Um, as of now, I understand there are not city services there. It would be it's designated for well and septic. Um, will city services come in? And if so, will that also uh, allow for further growth um, at this time? Um, and one of the questions I had, some of us got a letter and some of us didn't, and I don't know what the uh, delineation was between who received the letters and who did not. Um, I talked to some of my neighbors, they had no idea what I was talking about. Some of us did get letters. The uh, only thing I can ascertain is that the uh, people who can see the site are basically the ones that got the letters. Okay. Um, and my last comment has nothing really to do with this, but 
when I received this letter, I had no idea what it was talking about. Basically, I mean, I had a general idea, but the um, RSP and the RS20 and all that, I had, I had no idea what it was. I would like to ask the commission, if you send out a letter, can you please define the terms uh, so that a normal person like me can understand or else include a sacred decoder ring or something that I will know what it is? Uh, okay. That would be greatly appreciated. So, okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, do we have anyone else wishing from the audience wishing to speak? If not, then I will close the public hearings and bring it back before the commissioners. <clears throat> Commissioner Huff. Um, yeah, are there any plans to annex this? Is that in the future? And, and what, are your, what are your plans about uh, putting in providing utilities? Can they provide sewer to this without annexation? No, I didn't think so. Yeah, we have no plan to add any utilities. It's going to be planned for well and septic, just one, okay. for so, one house. Okay, so that does limit it to one house an acre. Well, the soil would, mm -hmm. um, we're planning on one house, but the soil may allow it for more. Are, are you thinking of having any kind of um, dedicated right of way to the possible <laughs> rail to trail that runs by the property? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Okay, Commissioner Miller. I just wanted to make an observation for the the benefit of the neighbor that came in, and of course I understand, but I wanted him to understand we have to assume that all the land in the county will be developed to the maximum that the zoning allows and make our decision based upon this. So really what we have a request today, even though the developer has announced one house, the maximum that the regulations has applied to the way the site sits today uh, might be as many as nine. Uh, of course, because you've got limited access, you can only get in and out on rhododendron, you'd have to put in streets and what have you, it might be fewer than nine. Uh, as it's zoned today, it's zoned for a non-residential purpose. And we have to assume that at some point, somebody is going to build some sort of non-residential facility in there that is consistent with the, the, the research park zoning that's there. Um, uh, it probably hasn't happened up to this point because there's no utilities. But if utilities were extended, if somebody saw that, they'd say, hey, here's a 10-acre parcel where we could put a research facility. They could come along and petition the city for annexation in order to get sewer and water. I don't know how difficult, difficult it would be, but we would have to assume that that's how it would be developed. And I'm going to say, putting myself in your shoes, I would rather have one to nine houses similar to the way my own property is developed over on Red Cedar Circle than uh, a non-residential research facility put in there that we're you know, twice a day people would be coming and going to work. Uh, I would think that would be over, in the long run, better, given the choices. Uh, and for that reason, I support this rezoning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to the staff, can you answer the citizens' questions with reference to the letters going out? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Pat Young again with the Planning Department. So. Um, the, our local ordinance uh, requires and we provide notice within 600 feet of the property. So I certainly understand your concern uh, about it. It's certainly possible some of your neighbors would not have gotten the notice because they were outside of that 600 foot radius. So again, that um, exceeds state law and, and is a pretty uh, one of the, the most expansive notification areas in the, in the state. So we, we try to make that as wide as possible, but there's always cases where someone immediately adjacent won't get it. In terms of the content of the letter, uh, we appreciate your comments. We try to be as clear as we can. One of the things we prominently highlight is the contact name so that if there's any questions, you can, you can talk to a, a human live. But we will try to make sure that we uh, have an English rather than plannerese as much as possible. <laughs> All right, that was going to be my second one. Okay. <laughs> Do we have uh, questions from commissioners? If not, then the chair will entertain a motion. Uh, Commissioner Davis? I'd like to make a motion to move. Zoning map change request Z1400010. Second. Second. Okay. 
motion by Commissioner Davis, second by Commissioner Winders, that we move forward with uh, zoning case 1400110. I mean, one zero. All in favor of this item, let it be known by I show your right hands. All opposed? Case zero, I mean, I'm scared, excuse me, Z1400010 has passed 12 to zero. The numbers go to running together after a while, don't they? <laughs> <clears throat> and public hearing for zoning map change requests, Ravenstone extension Z140014A. And Amy is not running to the podium. Uh, sir. Uh, the guy from, uh, he left. Okay. Mr. Chair, we got the gentleman's name on the, on the record, so we'll make sure it's in the minutes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Jacob Wiggins. Um, I'm with the Planning Department. Um, some of you may have seen me before. I've been with the Department for about a year and a half now. Um, most of my time is spent dealing with the Durham Board of Adjustments. Um, Mr. Wyman is allowing me the opportunity to dabble in annexations, which is what it has brought me here before you all this evening. Um, specifically, uh, the city received an annexation petition for Ravenstone, and, or what we're calling Ravenstone Extension, case Z14000148. Um, as part of the annexation request, there's an initial zoning that the city has to designate for the subject property. The property is currently split zoned RS20 and RR, um, and the city is requesting that the commission consider rezoning the RH20 portion of this site to RR, um, and that is approximately 4.27 acres of the development. Um, on the screen before you, you can see the entire area that is requested for annexation is highlighted in red. Um, there are five parcels, which are approximately 177 acres. The portion requested for the initial zoning um, to be down zoned from RH20 to RR I'm going to circle there on your screen. You can see that it's the portion along Sharon Road. Um, historically, the commission has noted that um, if it's an exact translation, um, then they automatically recommend approval and it goes to council. This case, as you can see, is not an exact translation as um, the RS20 portion is being requested to go to RR. Um, an aerial, as you can see, there are neighboring subdivisions on each side of this request. Most of the property, um, I believe, is vacant farmland. And I'm happy to answer any questions um, that the commission may have about this request. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do we have anyone in the audience that would like to speak to this? If not, I will close the public hearing. Uh, yeah. Eric Hester, how you doing? Master Officer Hester, are you speaking in favor or against? Just a concern. I uh, very much appreciate Ravenstone and what they represent in our community. My concern is as other concerns were expressed in the Holder Road area, uh, the density of the traffic we're dealing with and the calming measures that are not there. Um, we are having two lanes on 98 Highway there, and some days when I come home from work, it's, it's backed up a half mile to a mile from Sharon Road and 98 all the way back past almost to Grove Park. And then what we see on the other side, um, on the other end right there on Sharon Road, uh, we're just seeing a lot of a lot of traffic problems that are there. And if we're trying to get out of one of those little side streets, it's almost habit getting out of there. We're taking our life at our own risk. And I hesitate about saying anything because I know that there are regulations that, that are in place as far as zonings and those kinds of things. But my concern as a homeowner and a resident out there is 
the traffic in, in that regard. Would you state your name and address, please? I'm Eric Hester. I'm at 302 Robbins Road. Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, anyone else like to speak? Then I will close the public hearing. Commissioners, Commissioner Miller. I just wanted to speak to uh, Officer Hester. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. You've sat through a lot of hearings. So. Um, this is a uh, rezoning as a result of an annexation, and the annexation is already a decided thing. No, it's not. The, the annex uh, Pat Young again with the Planning Department. The annexation would proceed um, to to council uh, with this zoning as part of the annexation concurrent. action, including a utility extension agreement um, and an, yeah, in this initial zoning. Essentially, what's being proposed here by the staff is is a down zoning to the most restrictive zone we have pretty much we ain't got anything that's less than this uh, and so uh, if your concern is the development of the property that your your concern may be more about the annexation than the zone it will wind up in um, uh, presumably the annexation will make this property available for the extension of sewer and water make it more attractive for future development that's an annexation issue the property has to be zoned something and currently it's zoned RS20 and RR which would allow more development than just RR would is that correct members of the staff right yeah, that is correct this is a down zoning to the lowest permissible zone so as far as this body can in its recommendation to the elected officials uh, make a recommendation in favor of, of the points that you raised we would adopt what the staff is asking us to do. Uh, and I just wanted to kind of make that clear and to explain why, I'd be, why I will be supporting this rezoning. Any other comments? I have a question. Commissioner Freeman. I just wanted to know how the city or the county would go about a traffic and a calming measures plan for annexation and regards to this. Yeah, this is zone and this is not the annexation. Staff, would you like to, did you hear the question? Ms. Freeman, could you repeat the question? I couldn't quite hear that, I'm sorry. Pretty much I would like to know how you would go about attending to this gentleman's concerns about traffic and calming measures. Sure, sure. Uh, I may ask Bill Judge of the Transportation Department to speak in more detail, but um, if the zoning is successful, they'll have an, an entitlement to a certain number of units and then they'll have to submit a site plan. The site plan has uh, specifications about what transportation improvements are required based on the density and intensity of the use. Um, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that bill, but that the, the site plan would, is the mechanism we use to review in detail um, unless there's a transportation impact analysis or TIA required with the zoning, which the, would, there would not be with a, a zoning of this innate, uh, limited density. If there's no other comments, the chair will now entertain a motion. I'm Commissioner Davis. Zoning KZ 140014A. Moved by Davis. Second. Second by Whitley. Commissioner Whitley of <coughs> zoning case Z 14014A. All those in favor, let up and no, make sure sure right hand. All those in opposition? Case Z140014A has passed 12 to 0. Uh, next thing on the agenda is new business, and I have announcements. So, what do we have next? Right. Mr. Chair, next month we have three land use cases and one text amendment. Are there any other new business to come before this body tonight? <clears throat> okay, we do have uh, additional members of the Planning Commission. So what I would like to do starting from my right is for everyone to introduce themselves, the old and the new members. 
I'm Josh Hollingsworth. I, record, I represent the Triangle Township here in Durham County. And this is your first meeting? This is my first meeting, yes. Okay. I'm Elise Bielen. I'm a representative from the city. And how long have you been on the board? Uh, about a year now, I think. Okay. Melvin Whitley, I've been on the board four years and city appointee. Frederick Davis, county appointee. I've been on the board since 2009. Becky Winders, I'm a city appointee and I've been on here one month less than, than Melvin Whitley. <laughs> I'm David Harris, uh, city appointee and I think I've been on the board about three years. I'm Tom Miller. I'm appointed by the city council, and I've, this is probably my fifth month. Deidreana Freeman, and I was recently appointed. City I'm Brian appointed. Busby. I'm sorry. sorry. I'm Brian Busby. I'm a city appointee. I was appointed last week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Charlie Gibbs, <clears throat> and I've been on, I'm a county appointee. I've been on the board for about a year and a half. Linda Huff, I'm a county employee and I've been on the board for a few months. Ann, no, no, Ann, Linda Huff. Ann. You were previously a commissioner <laughs> oh, prior to this appointment. Yes, I was. My name is Elaine Hyman and I am a county appointee. And this is my first meeting. <laughs> Okay, all right, thank you everyone. So if there's no other business, we are in adjourn.